good morning, everybody. It's been a few months since I have seen you, and it's good to see so many familiar faces. Uh, for those of you I haven't met, uh, my name is Benjamin Van Dyne. He, him, and his are good pronouns to use for me. I hope you're all healthy and well here in the sanctuary, and also those of you at home. It has gotten like a little bit unseasonably chilly the last few days, but in my own life, things have been heating up because my own labor union of Fordham's graduate workers was on strike earlier this week, which we hadn't planned that way, but the spirit does have a way of moving. This last month was also the 112th anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in Manhattan, when poor working and safety conditions led to a disastrous fire that killed 146 people, mostly young women who worked sewing garments. And that labor, organized and otherwise, is part of what I want to talk about today. Because the last year or two has seen the most public labor organizing activity of my lifetime. Starbucks workers in more than 300 stores across the country. Amazon warehouse workers in Staten Island and Queens. Tech workers at the New York Times, eBay, Google. Solidarity among graduate workers like my own union and with a novel mix of old style unions and new ones. My own local, CWA 1104, is half higher ed workers and half exactly who you think they are, big, burly, Verizon line workers. The kind that used to be sung about in all these songs where all the workers are men. But that is not true in my union anymore. On the ground where things are concrete, it's all kinds of people doing the intense daily work of building solidarity, day after day. So I want to spend some time thinking through not labor as an abstraction, that is that, that work in general or workers in general are good. Because in my own recent experience, organizing my own union among graduate workers at Fordham, it is one thing to support organized labor in general, and it is another to support the union in front of you. On the one hand, there are comrades in my union that have no opinions about labor unions in general, but they know that they deserve better than poverty wages. They deserve independent ways to avoid workplace abuse and they know they can only get those things together. On the other hand, there are those whose stated commitment to organized labor hasn't translated into any real work on the ground. In my union, we sometimes call them the opinion havers, the people for whom having the right opinion trumps the need to actually do the work. May 1st, tomorrow, is the day that most of the world recognizes as Labor Day. And because of the way that Labor Day, May 1st, has been wrapped up in socialist politics, militancy and marches, when an official American holiday was devoted to labor, it was quite purposefully put in a different part of the year. And that holiday, September Labor Day, has suffered the fate of so many civic holidays, becoming a sort of bland commemoration of an idea, rather than an occasion for getting some stuff done. It's not too different, actually, from how Martin Luther King Day relates to the actual work of Martin Luther King. King was a theologian, a radical, a political tactician, and now he is widely commemorated as like a, a nice guy. It's not too different, actually, from how Christmas relates to the actual person and work of Jesus, who, depending on who you ask, is a teacher among his people, the Jews, 
the leader of a political and religious movement, or the very Son of God, and whose birthday we mark with sort of saccharine platitudes. Whatever your other convictions about Jesus, whoever you think he was or is, it seems to me that it would be much harder to forget the reality of that person. It's much easier to forget he had a mission and a purpose and an edge if we were to remember him on Good Friday, when we are forced to think about the consequences of mission and purpose and edge. On Good Friday, because it marks the crucifixion, the consequence of who Jesus was, it would be much harder to forget King, the radical tactician and theologian, if we were to remember him in April when he was assassinated rather than in January when he was born. It would force us to raise the question, why did he get murdered? There is something about blood that makes it harder to think in abstractions. So May 1st is not just when most of the rest of the world celebrates Labor Day, International Workers' Solidarity Day. It is like Good Friday, or April 4th, when King was killed, a day drenched in blood. The commemoration of organized labor on May 1st has some of its roots in the violence of the so-called Haymarket Affair in Chicago, when police violence against unions and broader civil unrest, including a bombing, resulted in solidarity marches across the world. Maybe in this country, we don't celebrate labor on that day because something about blood makes it harder to think in abstractions. May 1st has been the Labor Day that happens in public, that makes labor and self-determination in the workplace a public issue where everyone can see it. September Labor Day has come mainly to mark the beginning of the school and church calendar. It is reduced to an appreciation of working rather than an assertion of strength and solidarity. And speaking for myself from my own experience, I think appreciation can be the enemy of solidarity rather than its ally. This is true all over, I think, and in my case in particular. My own union first got organized in the wake of the first COVID wave. Because it's been true for a really, really long time that a $26,000 a year starting salary for full-time student workers is far less than a living wage in New York City. That's been true for a very long time. But during COVID, as our work doubled and our compensation stayed the same, we were supposed to feel compensated by the barrage of emails thanking us for our extra work as though the barrage of emails wasn't itself extra work. And when we'd ask, some of you may have experienced things like this, when we'd ask about getting more money or more time, we would get another barrage of appreciation. And that's why I think the May Labor Day, the one tomorrow, is the one to pay attention to. That's why I tell you that story about my own workplace. Because September Labor Day is an appreciation email. May Labor Day is a strike. May Labor Day is about the dignity of workers, where September Labor Day is about the dignity of work. And work is fine. But it is not work that the Unitarian Universalist principle insists has worth and dignity. It is the people, not because of what they produce or the labor they give, but because as people they are entitled to it. That worth and dignity is real, whether it is recognized or not. But it remains an abstraction if it is just blandly commemorated rather than made real in organizing and solidarity 
and action. Commemoration doesn't take planning. You need to think just far ahead enough to buy a wreath. Organizing. Well, organizing takes time. It takes patient conversation and good listening. Self-assertion and self-effacement in equal measure. It takes some quality time with spreadsheets and calendars. And it's not a criticism of anyone, I don't think, to say that there's something about the structure of Sunday worship that encourages commemoration, finding the theme that goes with the day. To commemorate something is to remember it. So when we commemorate labor, that's good, that's fine. But I think also about the way that some womanist scholars and ethicists write the word remember with a hyphen between re and member. Re-member. To member again. To put the parts back together. What has been dismembered, taken apart, must be re remembered, stitched back together. And if we believe, Unitarian Universalist or not, if we believe in the interdependent web of creation, of which we are all a part, it means that all our coming together is remembering. It's being put back together, because from the beginning, we were all one. If September Labor Days can tempt us into living as individual pieces, maybe May Labor Days are for stitching back together. But anyone who sews knows that stitching takes time. If, like me, you are new to sewing, you know it involves a lot of ripping seams, trying to figure out how the heck it is that one correctly threads a bobbin. Stitching takes time. It takes mistakes. It takes lots of failure and wearing imperfect garments. And most union organizing isn't the picket line. It's the conversations, hundreds, thousands of them, that involve everybody, wherever they're at. Solidarity is the slow, painstaking work of re-membering, of putting back together, of stitching one seam one relationship at a time. So I'm getting it on our calendars. For every year, tomorrow, May 1st, and every year, May 1st. The Labor Day drenched in blood, not sugar and barbecue sauce. The day we march together, not the day we all go into our backyards and fire up a million different grills. The day for remembering, not just calling the members to mind. The day for organized solidarity in the concrete, not some abstraction of labor. The day for the dignity of the people who work, not the dignity of working. So when I say, solidarity forever, I don't just mean the slogan. When I say solidarity forever, I don't just mean the song. When I say solidarity forever, I don't just mean support the union and go out marching. When I say solidarity forever, I mean that slow work of relationship, of stitching, of things like checking in at coffee hour, the slow, small work that makes the big, fast work possible. So hear what I mean when I say these words of blessing. Solidarity today, solidarity tomorrow, solidarity forever. May it be so. 
Hi, and welcome to Getting the Message, where we dive a little bit deeper into the subjects of today's message. And I am so excited to get to sit down with Benjamin Van Dyne once again for the first time since I think what you were here last in November. That sounds right. Yes. Vaguely somewhere around there. <laughs> yes. And in much chillier times. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Especially because we are, in fact, recording this on one of those nice warm days. Oh, yes. Um, that is happening before uh, the message itself. And uh, a little bit strange to have such a warm day in April. Yeah. It is It is good to be back together. And it was good to uh, have you join us at, at Forth. Um, so, first of all, uh, for those who only know Labor Day as the day where you don't wear white uh, in September, what can you tell us about May 1st as a different way to celebrate Labor Day? Well, as I, as I mentioned in the, in the sermon, there, there's a really distinctive history to May Labor Day that um, has an origin point in the Haymarket Affair in Chicago, which was a multi-day labor action. There was a bombing, there were police beatings of protesters and strikers. Um, and in an era in the early 1900s when the international connections among labor organizations and socialists were extremely strong, that early May became a time for not so much celebration as militant labor action, um, right? And was, was adopted by people everywhere uh, to such a degree that when Labor Day became an official federal holiday, a, a different date was chosen because uh, in, in September, literally on the other side of the year, um, and that it's, it's orientation um, in a way that I'm not sure I, I'm not, I'm not sure there's any good history of how this happened, right? And I would love to read one uh, if anybody out there is looking for a book project um, of how this sort of shift happened from uh, focus on workers to focus on work. Right. Which is a really different orientation, right? I mean, you know, you could focus on workers. Those are people. Like work is production. It's your usefulness, um, which is a, which is a shame. That's that's a, a fascinating uh, way of describing it to me as somebody who previously worked retail and previously worked retail at Lowe's, which is uh, notoriously busy on days like Labor Day and Memorial Day. Yeah. Um, you know, it's. It, it is, you know, fascinating the way that Labor Day has become like, like you said, a celebration of the work and like largely more for like the management and the office folks and the, you know, yeah. meanwhile, it's, it's the low wage the workers. It's not the class that gets to yeah. celebrate. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, a fascinating difference from like the idea of like an international working class sort of sort of day that, that May 1st generally resonates as. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a fascinating, a fascinating way of thinking about it. Um, I'm curious, you know, why why this message for for you, for you use, you know, why what 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 inspired it for you? Yeah, I mean I think there's there's a personal context and then there's sort of the the you you and forth you context. I you know, I um you know, I'm a member of a labor union. I'm a graduate worker at Fordham University. Uh, we're, you know, this time last year, we had just won our union election. And now we are in the middle of a really, really tough contract fight um, with escalating actions. And, you know, um, you know, some of which are public and some of which, you know, you'll see uh, as those things go more public. Um, so that's some of the personal context. It's just quite simply been on my mind. Um, but I think for you use and for fourth you in particular, there is this, um, you know, this question of like inherent worth and dignity of people, I think gets covered up a lot by ideologies of productivity, of work, of, of usefulness, right? Which was like a theme that we talked about, I think, uh, early in our earlier conversation back in November, right? Is that, that 
the characterization of people as needing to be of use, right, is incredibly common, even in our own liberal religious contexts. And if we stop to think about it, is in this sort of like tension with the idea that people have inherent worth and dignity. Um, inherent, like not dependent on their productivity. Um, so I think for me, there is, you know, it comes back to some of the same things of the, the last time I was there for you. Um, and, and I also think, frankly, that, that there is this, con like the, the current political environment that we live in, right? Where um, I think, you know, and, and this is my own analysis that others may or may not share, right? But speaking for myself, as I look at that, sort of, you know, creeping fascism, like what we saw in, in, um, in Tennessee over the last couple of weeks, right? Even in New York City where, you know, the school budget is being cut, the parks budget is being cut, the library is being cut, um, you know, and it's all going to police, right? Because enforcement and people with guns is like the main thing we think government can and should do. Um, you know, that, that I think we're seeing the limits of a politics that like lacks that radical organized edge, right? That, that lacks sort of a mass movement character. Um, and we have seen the emergence of, uh, not only in the labor movement, but certainly in the labor movement, the kinds of mass action, you know, this, this week there are 9,000 instructors at Rutgers that are on strike, right? This is like the largest higher education strike on the East Coast in many, many decades. Um, and for the first time it's instructors of every rank, right? And, you know, true Columbia, that was true of University of California uh, last year. So all of those have sort of been swirling around as I've been thinking around, um, um, yeah, and, and yeah. You mentioned uh, in the description that you sent out to uh, the staff as we prepped our various mm -hmm. parts, uh, you mentioned solidarity. And that got me thinking mm -hmm. about, we, so we just finished uh, about a month ago, <clears throat> we finished a religion and socialism series. Uh, yeah. And uh, you know, one of the things that we talked about in that is like congregations and religious communities as, as a site for building this solidarity and for building movements and for being a meeting place that people um, can get education, can um, become get pulled in to be part of this movement for justice. You know, how do you see, <clears throat> how do you see like our, our role in, in, you know, what, I guess, what is solidarity to you? What does that look like? And like, how do you see uh, as people in faith communities, mm -hmm. like, how do you see us having a role in building solidarity. Yeah. Um, I mean, in some way, this is the question of a lifetime, right? But uh, I, I, I'll say a couple things. I mean, I think at, at the very like specific level, um, when I was organizing with churches in, in Lexington, Kentucky, maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, one of the pastors there said something that I've never forgotten. And he, he was saying this to his fellow clergy, right? He was Lutheran, but he was talking to Baptists and Catholics and Unitarians. And, and he said, look, I know you're all nervous about bringing like the organizing world and this sort of political action to your congregations. But if you go with them to the graveside, they will come with you to the mayor's office. And I think, I always think about that because I think there is a temptation to regard those fears as totally separate. But the fact is like, we're confronted by the powers of death and destruction and sin, as I would call it, right? In, in all kinds of ways. Um, at the bedside and the graveside and in the mayor's office. And so I think, you know, just the sense that we are in this together um, and that there, are, there aren't really spheres of life that we can carve out and say, well, we're in this together, well, no, except for that, right? Um, no, I, I bet you, as you mentioned that, um, 
it has me thinking, and this is a very, very niche um, <laughs> example. Um, but so obviously trans issues are, you know, going less than ideally in the national conversation right now, yeah. um, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, and um, so um, I am not one who cares much about who Mr. Beast is or anything to do with him. I know he's popular, kind of seems mm -hmm. annoying to me. Um, you know, hashtag, hopefully this video doesn't get flamed for me saying that. Um, but, you know, in general, he's not been somebody I really cared about. But uh, right. one of one of his, like, uh, major people on the page uh, came out on, like, on his, on his channel, came out as trans, is on HRT, and was, like, publicly yeah. talking about that. And, uh, like, Mr. Beast, who is the figure that a lot, especially, like, young kids look up to, mm -hmm. um is out like arguing in Twitter comments and being like, this transphobia is ridiculous. And like yeah. previously I would not have pegged him as a particularly progressive person. Um, but like, that is the difference that walking with somebody and seeing that journey and then seeing the stuff that they're dealing with is yeah. going to make you aware of like, so as you were talking about, you know, if, if you're showing up for somebody in this hard moment, then they will also show up in other people's hard moments. Absolutely. So I and, and I think that that is, you know, one of the, one of the complications here, I think, is that it's, um, it differs from a kind of like triangulation, right? So to give you the example from my labor union, right? Like we're a labor union. We're not a trans rights organization, right? But there are trans members of the labor union. And, you know, we're at a Catholic school, right? Like, there are members of our union who are deeply uncomfortable or even like opposed to equal rights for trans people. Um, we have people in the union who don't think there is such a thing as being trans, right? They would imagine trans people as mentally ill or deluded or confused or uh, in the language of the Roman Catholic magisterium, intrinsically disordered, right? Um, and I think, you know, there, you know, if it, if it were just a matter of like triangulation or calculation, um, probably the coordinating committee of which I'm a member would like sort of stay away from trans stuff, right? We would have stayed away from like Roe v. Wade when Roe v. Wade was overturned, right? But I think, you know, the, the old labor saying that um, an injury to one is an injury to all, right? Has really governed us there that we, we haven't ever sat down to do the math of what we would gain or lose by choosing to make like support for transition and other healthcare for trans people part of what we are bargaining for in our contract. We've never weighed, you know, would we win more support in our bargaining unit? by supporting that or opposing that. No, an injury to one is an injury to all, right? And so we're bargaining for that, right? We didn't do the math. I mean, we had a lot, there was a lot of internal dissent. I mean, we lost some union members when we said, you know, like, like uh, reproductive health care is like a worker issue, right? Um, like we had a couple of people sent their letters in to resign from the union. Right. We didn't do the calculation. We said an injury to one is an injury to all. And, and I think that that's really, you know, and I think we talked about this in the last conversation. I came of age politically during the Clinton years where it was very like, all right, do you win? If you win six people by doing welfare reform in this way and you lose five, well, you come out one ahead. So let's do it. Right. So, uh, and that that was the kind of, it was very much polling driven. Um, and that I think is, it's not about getting 50% plus one. It's about standing together, like without respect to the math. Now the math is important. You gotta do the math. You gotta, right? You have to sort of figure out how to win, but that that's not what's driving your sort of basic decisions about how you move in the world. You know, to me, that seems like uh, the perfect place for us to, you know, that is, right. you know, an injury to one is an injury to all. That an is, injury to one is an injury to all. That's what should motivate us. Uh, Benjamin, thanks so much for sitting down. Thank you for so this much. Discussion. It's always fun. And thanks as always to all of our listeners. Mm -hmm.